In this episode, we're going to look at the real major contribution that Charles Darwin made to the theory of evolution. It had been known for a long, long time, or, or it had been suspected for a long, long time, that organisms changed, that they weren't fixed. But Darwin is the one that really first proposed the mechanism by which organisms are able to change over time, and that mechanism he called natural selection. So the question that existed for a long time is everyone noticed that so many organisms, for example, like this grasshopper, who is almost uh, very difficult to see in this picture, everyone noticed that organisms seem to be incredibly well adapted, well fit for their environment, and nobody knew why. People thought each organism had been specially created. Some people thought, no, organisms are not fixed. They change over time. But what they didn't understand is if organisms changed, that would make them less fit to live in their environment. For example, this grasshopper blends in very well. It has, it's a great example of camouflage. If it were to change, um, it would not be able to survive as well, and therefore it would die out. So Darwin came along and proposed this idea of natural selection. One of the evidences that Darwin used for his idea of natural selection is something that people had known about for a long time, and it's what we call artificial selection. In other words, it is a type of selection that is done by man to produce certain traits in domesticated organisms. For example, it had been known for a long time that you could take a plant like the wild mustard seed and get a great diversity of foods from it, like cauliflower, broccoli, cabbage, kale. Um, these are all plants that had come from one type of plant, and Darwin knew this, and so Darwin understood that there was a great amount of variation that existed in populations. In other words, there were genetic differences in any species, and if a person were to only breed organisms that had that type of gene set or those types of variations, you could get an organism that was very different from the originals. Another example is the domestication and breeding of the wolf. So we now know because of genetics that all dogs all domestic dogs we have today, um, things that are as different as a bulldog to a Datsun to Chihuahuas, Bull Mastiff, whatever the types of dogs, they all came from the wolf, and that is because of the variation that existed in the genes of those original wolves that were brought in, um, domesticated, and bred. So what Darwin then said is if man can do this, through breeding over subsequent generations, why in the world can nature not do the same thing? Darwin also noticed that there seemed to be a struggle for existence that he observed in nature. And so, as you can see in these photographs, all around us, there are organisms that are struggling to survive. They have to kill each other to survive. They have to avoid being killed and eaten to survive. And so Darwin looked at this and realized what if the struggle for existence could somehow create something similar to the artificial selection that man was already doing with plants and animals. What Darwin speculated is that in this struggle for existence it is inevitable that with the variation that exists in populations, you have some organisms that are more fit, in other words, better adapted to live in their environment than others. And so this is where we get the language survival of the fittest. And what that simply means is that in any given situation, some organisms will be able to better survive and therefore they will be able to pass on their genes to the next generation, pass their DNA. A good example of this, a classic example, is what we call the peppered moths. 
And in recent years, the validity of this particular model has been questioned by some people, but it, it still represents a very good thought process for understanding the idea of natural selection. Here we see a photograph of these peppered moths in their environment. And essentially what happened is before the Industrial Revolution, the trees were very healthy. The Industrial Revolution brought about a lot of pollution, a lot of smog, air pollution, and there is a particular type of symbiotic organism called a lichen, which is actually half fungus and half algae, and these are typically the first organisms to go, and you can see them on the tree here. They're all over the tree, kind of this white looking leaf-like structure, and they're the first, or first organisms to go when you have a lot of pollution. So before the Industrial Revolution, you had two types of peppered moth. You had a peppered moth that was very light colored and white, and you can just barely see it right here. It blends in very well. It's very well camouflaged. You also had a phase of peppered moth that was very dark. Now the question is, if you are a hungry bird and you are wanting to eat one of these moths, you are going to obviously choose, uh, unconsciously choose, the dark moth because that's going to be the one that you see. So there will be a very low number of dark phase moths in the population, and controversially there will be a high number of light colored in the population because the light colored ones blend in. Now in the Industrial Revolution there was a lot of pollution and what that did is that actually killed off a lot of the lichen on the trees and then you had this scenario going on. So now the advantage goes to the dark colored moth and the disadvantage goes to the light colored moth. What this means now is that the light colored moths are not going to be able to survive as well so you will see the number of light colored moths decrease in the population and you will see the number of dark colored moths increase and that is natural selection. There's a struggle for existence these moths are trying to survive, they're trying to keep from being eaten there's variation in the population. We have dark color, genes that contribute to a dark colored moth and genes that contribute to a light colored moth. And organisms that are more fit before the Industrial Revolution, that would have been the light colored moths. And then after the Industrial Revolution, that would have been the dark colored moths. The more fit organisms are going to better survive and pass on their genes. And therefore, nature will select in favor of them. Now, how does that look in terms of genetics and evolution? If we look at this chart over here on the left, what it shows is you start with a parent organism, um, and it has some offspring, and there is variation. You've got to have variation in order for natural selection to occur. So there's variation in the offspring. But if this were in the post-industrial revolution, uh, revolution age, the light colored moths are going to be selected against. In other words, they're more likely to be eaten, more likely to fall prey, and so they are less likely to pass their genes on into the next generation. And therefore, over time, darker moths are going to survive. So in we have our first generation, and then we have this second and third and fourth and fifth and this sixth generation. Well, in the third generation, we get rid of pretty much all of the lightest alleles. Well, we're still, in each generation, the advantage always goes to the darkest organism. And so we get rid of some more of those. And so the end result is that we go from being a fairly light population of organisms to a population that is fairly dark. And that is a classic example of natural selection and survival of the fittest. So over time, organisms that are better in adapted to their environment, such as these organisms, these insects that have incredible camouflage, 
the better their camouflage is, the more likely they are to survive and the more likely they are to pass their genes on to the next generation. This moth right here, when you first looked at this picture, you might have thought these were two large eyes staring back at you. Well, that's the trick that the moth plays on predators. It is able to trick predators into thinking that this is the face of a large organism and not a small moth that's vulnerable to being eaten. To quickly recap, we must have variation in a population, which means that of all the organisms in the population, they're all different because of their DNA in some way. And because of that variation, some will survive better than others, and we call that survival of the fittest. And that is due to what Darwin called the struggle for existence. And that is those those three things in tandem are going to lead to what we call natural selection. So the final thing we're going to talk about is what we like to call the evolutionary arms race. And essentially what that means is that because of this constant struggle for existence, you have, for example, organisms like the zebra that are constantly evolving to be faster and more equipped to escape predators. In other words, zebras that are faster, zebras that are better able to detect the presence of predators in the first place, are going to be more likely to survive and therefore more likely to have children pass on their genes. But at the same time, you also have the predator who is also evolving and adapting due to natural selection to be faster and to have more stealth ability to be able to sneak up on prey. And we call that the evolutionary arms race. There is a constant struggle for existence and therefore some organisms are more fit to survive than others and those organisms are passing their genes on to the next generation and that is the basis for Darwin's theory of evolution.